salutations, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. And behind me, you can see the house where Sir Charles Dilk lived uh, for most of his adult life. So uh, Sir Charles Dilk was um, one of the best known politicians of the late Victorian era, but he, he's all but forgotten these days, unless you're particularly a scholar of uh, history. So uh, he was a second baronet. That's to say his father also had the handle Sir. An ordinary man like me, just plain Mister. Um, I know we use Sir as a courteous appellation for any man, especially if you don't know his name. But if you say Sir, then followed by the Christian name, then that's because uh, he is a knight or indeed a baronet. The difference is baronets have inherited it, passes from father to son. What if there's more than one son, the eldest one only, and only to those born within wedlock? Um, whereas, uh, yeah, a knight is just for the lifetime of the individual. So uh, it's, it's a way that somebody um, is honoured. Anyway, uh, Sir Charles Dilk's family was, was very wealthy. So uh, Charles Dilk didn't really work in all his life, apart from being a member of parliament. And there was no salary for being a member of parliament, in fact, until the year he died, 1911. So he was born in 1843, and he went to Cambridge University. He studied at Trinity Hall. That's not Trinity College. It's, Trinity Hall's a different one but uh, not quite as illustrious as Trinity. And he was elected president of the Cambridge Union, which is the debating society of Cambridge University, although it's actually just outside the auspices of the, of, of, of the um, university. So the proctors, that's to say the uh, dons who are in charge of discipline, had no uh, remit there. Um, it's um, the second oldest debating society uh, in, um, in the United Kingdom. Um, it's older than the Oxford Union. It's 1816 it was founded. It's, um, there's one in St Andrews that's slightly older. In Ireland, we've got older ones at Trinity College Dublin. The HIST, as in Historical Society, despite the name, it's a debating society, or the PHIL, as in the Philosophical Society. But back um, to uh, Dilk. So, by all accounts, uh, he was a very resourceful, quick-witted debater. He had a very melodious um, and, and listenable speaking voice, so he had all the attributes that were required for a successful career as a statesman. Remember, public speaking was so much more important in the 19th century and well into the 20th century because, of course, there was no sound recording, there was no television, there were newspapers, not everybody was literate, but um, by the time he came along, there were very few men who were totally illiterate. And, of course, the poorer people who were less likely to be literate didn't have the right to vote. But anyway, you, you were expected to address large public meetings of thousands of people, even tens of thousands of people. So a stentorian voice would be a, a great advantage, had to be able to reject his voice and so on, um, and to speak with verve and poise, uh, as well as just be able to come up with things and debates when he got into the House of Commons. So he was duly elected for Chelsea, which was just uh, west of where we're standing back then, and had only, only just um, effectively become part of London. Of course, back then it was uh, really a, a borough in the county of Middlesex. It wasn't until 1889 that it was officially incorporated uh, into um, London. So he's a member of the Liberal Party, and he was a man of very advanced views for his uh, era. And in 1871, he caused a deafening outcry by calling for the abolition of the monarchy. Um, now, this was staggering, well, so it may seem. However, Queen Victoria was not as popular then as you might imagine. Her husband, Prince Albert, had died in 1861 at the age of 42, and she'd gone into mourning, as was regarded as, as being neat at the time, wearing all black, refusing invitations to any party or any theatrical performance. Um, but uh, she took this bereavement to heart. This was no mere show on her part. She really was grief-stricken. Um, now, people thought this went on for too long. Her wearing black, sometimes it wasn't, only wear, it wasn't solely wearing black, but mostly dark colors affecting a very somber attitude. Well, there was no contrivance on her, her part. There's no doubt that um, this, uh, this uh, sadness was heartfelt on her part. But people thought she was too more than to snap out of it. Remember, life expectancy was much shorter back then. It's only about 50. So most people had suffered bereavements of spouses, you know, often younger than that, of children. There were a few families which didn't have at least one cot death. So uh, she was lucky that all of her children made it to, uh, to adulthood. And um, anyway, so um, people were calling the widow of Windsor, saying she wasn't making so many public appearances. There were Republican clubs. So his anti-monarchist views were um, not as um, really out there as you might, or you might have imagined. But for the Conservative Party was ardently royalist. 
the Liberal Party almost as much so. But um, anyway, he was denounced so furiously that he retracted that, said, OK, let's keep the monarchy. Remember, this was a time of a revolution on the continent, like um, Italy, was it France had had a revolution in 1840, and we well, just had another one, I suppose, in 1871. That's another thing, the French Civil War was raging after the defeat by the German states. So was Italy to be a monarchy, a republic, it ended up being a, uh, being a kingdom. Uh, but there were um, uh, Republican revolutionaries elsewhere. Of course, in Ireland, uh, it was the time of rising tension. The Irish Republican Brotherhood is saying, let's um, sever all um, the links which connect us to our kith and kin in Great Britain. Uh, another thing that we, might seem to be rather surprising about Dilk um, is uh, he was a passionate imperialist. And indeed, he uh, penned a tome entitled Greater Britain, which was a book in which he um, Adam rates the case for imperialism. I think this really could advance the liberal cause and uh, was um, enlightening and civilizing um, lesser breeds without the law, as Kipling might have later put it on. And now liberalism is now, sorry, is now regarded as antithetical to to um, uh, imperialism, but not so back then. He particularly wanted to foster um, close links with the dominions, with Australia, with New Zealand, uh, with Canada, with Newfoundland remembering Newfoundland was not part of Canada until 1949. Um, and indeed, um, South Africa to properly in in to integrate the Transvaal Republic, the Orange Free State, allow them to be republics, but I won't crazy the whole uh, the whole work right here. So um, people thought he might be the next first Lord of the Treasury. Uh, remember, the, the, the Liberals were there until 1874 in, um, in government, then they lost, and Disraeli came in, the Conservative Prime Minister. So he was a man who eschewed racial and religious prejudice, wasn't an anti-Semite at all. Um, there were a few anti-Semites in the Conservative benches, despite the Earl of Beaconsfield, their leader, being of, of Jewish stock, though Christian by faith. And a few of the Liberals muttered anti-Semitic imprecations against Disraeli, calling him Shylock and so forth. Uh, so uh, he, it, it all came unstuck when um, uh, there was this divorce case in which he was cited. He was, seems to have been a bit of a... a um, womanizer, but Satarias has extended as far as having an affair with his brother's mother-in-law, uh, Mrs. Ellen Smith. But then in the divorce case, he was cited as co-respondent, as supposedly having had carnal knowledge of uh, someone else, of um, uh, Mrs. Victoria, God, I can't remember, Crawford, I think that was it. Now, many people think that he actually wasn't guilty of that, so not that it was a crime, it was a civil matter. Um, but divorce is a very lengthy, complex um, uh, legal process. And there needed to be strong evidence of adultery in those days. Very few other grounds, homosexuality, bestiality, um, d the abandonment and cruelty were not sufficient reasons as for, say, um, irreconcilable differences. Forget it. That wasn't it. It was regarded as a sacrament. So law was extraordinarily unusual back then and was regarded as um, uh, an absolute scandal, a blot on the escutcheon for the extended family. So far better be immiserated by a ghastly marriage than to dissolve the marriage. Um, Anyway, uh, the, the, the judge rendered a verdict which only a jurist could come up with. It was so ludicrous. He ruled that it was proven that, yes, this woman had committed adultery with Sir Charles Dilk, but it was not proven that Sir Charles Dilk had committed adultery with her. What? Um, so it's quite complicated, the, the, the court cases, when he would testify, when he wouldn't. Joseph Chamberlain, another luminary of the Liberal Party, advising him not to speak in his own defence, him producing his journal, and, he, and he'd um, cut bits out of it. Was this in order to kind of uh, to hide some of the statements but which would, which would um, tend to inculpate him? Or uh, did it have any uh, evidentiary value? Um, or the identity of the factor to exonerate himself. But uh, that really put pay to his, his political career. And uh, he lost his seat. And Henry Matthews, the barrister who'd, um, who'd uh, argued for the other side, he was duly elected in a previously liberal held seat as a Conservative. So he was out of Parliament for a while, Sir Charles, and he was later re elected for Forest of Dean, um, despite uh, the Liberal leader, William Hewitt Gladstone pleading them not to do so, because getting the Liberals a bad name. This was just 1886, just after the defeat of the first Home Rule Bill, um, and it, that uh, Gladstone thought he needed this like he needed a hole in the head. They were very judgmental. It was the um, height of Victorian uh, Puritanism. So uh, then Dill, um, he managed to, as I say, got elected for Forrester Dean later, but he never had such a prominent career again. 
He's notable for being one of the few people in the Liberal Party back then to advocate for um, universal suffrage, saying that every man at the age of 21 ought to have the right to vote, even if he has not lived there for very long, because previously the franchise has been designed to keep um, the poorer people out, not allow them to vote because they're ignorant or they might actually want to vote for their own betterment, as in higher taxation on the affluent, decent services. Jill also demanded publicly funded schooling for every child. Well, that's something he achieved quite early in, in his political career. Uh, so he was very well connected and met very, really all the notable people in politics and indeed royalty, though after 1886 they wanted nothing to do with him because he would disgrace them, despite them being libertines themselves. Uh, so um, he married twice, not through divorce, his first wife died. Um, and um, his second wife was a feminist, and that was very unfashionable at the time. And he also concurred with her. So he's a man um, of a very advanced view, he's quite a few decades ahead of his time, Sir Charles Steele. But uh, because of these uh, allegations of adultery and um, evidence from servants about his comings and goings, really Apart from the woman who said, yes, I committed adultery with him. The servants they were saying, well, he came into this room and then he went out of the room later on. What went on in the room, I can't say. Anyway, that is Sir Charles Dilk. But uh, do make sure that you follow me uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. And um, make sure you're subscribed to me. Uh, book me for Skype lessons um, in any humanities subject, including law and French. And choose me as your tour guide in London. Thank you so much for your liberal donations on, uh, on Patreon and on PayPal. PayPal, it's georgecallahan79 at gmail.com. Well, as Super Ted would say, cheery bye-bye.